remembering Professor Tony Mabesa. It was in 1994, 25 years ago. Can you believe that? I never thought I'd be the guy to say 25 years ago, but yet, you know, you'll blink and 25 years will pass by. It was in 1994 when I first had, when I had my first brush with um, Sir Tony Mabesa. We were just finished, or we had just finished doing a play with Professor Oji Juliano, which was the Greenbird in 94. And the next play, uh, or the play that followed that was Enemy of the People. Uh, Henry, Henrik Ibsen's Enemy of the People and Professor Tony Mabesa directed that play. And, you know, coming off from the high of The Green Bird, which was my first play for Dulaang UP, I wanted to join that play as well, but you couldn't because, you know, it's the next performance and you can't rehearse both, you know. While, while the other play is wrapping up, or you know, going into technical rehearsals, nagsisimula na yung rehearsal ng susunod na play. So I wasn't able to join Enemy, Enemy of the People, but I watched it uh, in the Guerrero Theater. And right away, it was different because it was in the round. So coming from, from Greenbird, um, this, this stage play was, was done in the round. So there were seats on the stage uh, itself. So the audience can be part of the of the production so so I did go ahead and I, and I did sit in, on the on the stage and I remember it was completely different from the green bird and it was completely different from any other play that I've seen in the past um, it, first of all it was a complete contrast to the green bird which was all reds and greens and golds and yellows and uh, enemy of the people was a stark black and white and gray um, but what struck me about uh, Enemy of the People and, and, and Tony Mabesa's direction of it was there was this one scene there where um, Alex Cortez and Oji Juliano, they were the, or was it Maynard Peñalosa? I think, I believe it was Maynard Peñalosa and Alex Cortez. Uh, they were the protagonists and the antagonist in the play. And they suddenly stripped down revealing they were wearing uh, sumo wrestler uniforms under and they proceeded to to wrestle like sumo wrestlers in the middle of the play and that was something I've never seen before but it worked um, it didn't it was not heavy-handed or pretentious because you know it it was um, a device that was used but it wasn't throughout the whole play so it was just in one part so it was very striking and um, it left a, a deep impression uh, on me when I saw that and I was like wow that was magnificent almost magical to have the uh, the guts and the, the you know to, to do something like that in a in a in a classic play uh, so that was my first my first experience of, of seeing a Tony Mabesa play and I was blown away. I really wanted so much to work with him or get a chance to work with him. But as you know, during that time, he wouldn't direct as much already. Very, very limited. In fact, I remember a time when he would uh, say that he was retiring that year. So that would be his last production. So that was the enemy of the people. My next um, encounter or experience with him was in... Was it 1996 or 1997's? Any ah, uh, the women. The well, it originally was the women. So, but he he had a version where it was gender bending, and all the women's roles were played by men. So that was completely unheard of back in the day. Remember, this was the late 90s, almost 20 years ago, or 20 more than 20 years ago. So while we had uh, a female cast, uh, Eugene Domingo was there, um, Irene, I remember Irene was there. Um, I think Bam was in one of the, was also there in, in, was one of the members also, or one of the performers in the female cast of the women, but in the we men, the male version, uh, the starring roles were, um, Joseph Pe or Pepe, uh, Gwyn Guanzon, and Jacques Borlaza. 
and also Richie Chan was there. Uh, I remember uh, Joel, even Joel Saracho and Danny Mandia even had roles there. Uh, and I had a bit role. I just wanted to join the play during the time. I just wanted to be able to work with Tony Mabesa. I was a sophomore um, by this time, really very amateur. Uh, and I had a bit role as the maid, and I alternated with with Herbert um, Herbert Martinez. Yeah, we we played the maid. I think he was doing the Filipino version. I was doing the English version. Um, but even during that time, during rehearsals for the We Men, uh, I would hear uh, Sir Tony already. You know, he has a lot of these axioms or these sayings about theater and life in general. That would really hit you. Um, so one of the things that I, I heard from him during that time was that beauty on stage lasts five seconds only. Uh, yeah, you can be pretty, you can be handsome, and you can be striking, but that will last you five seconds on stage. After that, you better have something to say or you better have some talent to show. So when I heard that, I was like, oh my God, that's so true. Um, and then another one of his, his sayings or teachings that, uh, that I learned from him in the course of re rehearsing with him was that 50% of uh, the work of the director is casting the right people. If you have the right actors uh, for your play or for your production, 50% of your work is done. Everything else will follow. So if you have the right actors, if, if you know how to choose the right actors and cast the right actors, that 50% of your work as a director is done. But also, he said, I remember him saying that theater is the actor's art. It's not the director, unlike uh, in cinema. Um, it's not the writer, unlike in literature. So... Um, theater is the only art wherein it's the actor who's in charge. The director can, can, can block and direct you and inspire you and everything. But once the play is going on already, once it's running, there's nothing that the director can do. The actor can have a bad day or have a great performance or just go crazy and do whatever he or she wants. But it's all in their hands already once it's... Uh, it's running once it's live you can't control it you know the actor can suddenly forget their lines or ad lib or improvise or just do something spectacular and unexpected and that's what makes it um, theater as he would describe it a very um, fleeting and ephemeral art because it's not captured it's not on a canvas it's not even on film it's something that's live and once the the production is done or once the play is done it's over it just lingers in your memory you just remember it so yeah theater is the actor's art and another thing that um so after uh after the we men i got a chance to to be part of uh, professor tony mabesa's production again when he did othello um, I think that was in 98 or 99 even, but it might have been 98. He did Othello and I was so excited to audition for him. By this time, I had maybe a few plays under my belt. Um, I did some plays for Gantimpala even because I really wanted to be a good actor. Um, so I had a little bit more confidence uh, to audition for him. Uh, so I auditioned for, for Othello, and I remember I did the monologue of Brabantio in for Othello. And I remember, I think, at two years before... And I chose that, that monologue because two years prior, um, Professor Anton Juan did the production of Othello in... Uh, I, I think it was in Campaginaldo or some other theater, but it wasn't for Dulaang UP. He did Othello prior to that, a year or two years before that, and it was and it starred. I remember it was um, Bongoy Manahan, uh, who played the father in the beginning, and um, 
the director from uh, the director from Dula uh, from Tanghalang Ateneo Ricky Abad who played Iago so I I got re I got blown away by uh, uh, Mr. Bongoy Manahan's delivery of that uh, opening monologue in in Othello um, so I wanted to so I wanted to do the same for my audition with with Sir Tony so I auditioned and you know when he compliments you it's a it's a huge deal uh it's 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 a great feeling for him to recognize that you do a good job or that you're you're talented um but i remember fondly and distinctly that after i did that monologue he said that was so nice to hear coming from you um and i was i was you know i was of course i was you know i i couldn't believe it that that he was praising my my audition and he mentioned like something like it's very classic and uh very british uh which is funny because all throughout the <laughs> all throughout the production uh Eugene Domingo and Stella Cagnette would would make fun of me and call would call me the brilliant british actor Ricky Bizes because that's what uh Tony Mabesa started calling me throughout the whole production um, and I remember him saying, if ever I was going to do Hamlet, I will cast you as Hamlet. And that was the biggest compliment, the biggest compliment ever for me as a stage actor for Tony Mabesa to say something like that about me. So um, that, was a, that was a great experience uh, doing Othello with Romnick Sarmenta, Stella Cagnette, um, Mario Magalona, um, and of course um, Bernardo Bernardo and um, Floyd Quintos in the role of Iago. Um, but in, at this time, um, you know, Sir Tony would continue with his with his sayings, um, and I remember uh, for Othello, he said something like. Um, he wants his actors to be tall. Height is very important for him. That's why he loved Maynard Peñalosa. He loved Jack Berlaza. He loved Joseph Pe, Gwyn Guanzon. These guys are all tall. And Mario Magalona, of course. And um, uh, so he was saying that it's important for his um, actors to be tall. And Jake Aragon, I remember even Jake Aragon, uh, when they did Feely. He always cast tall actors, and that was a challenge for me because I obviously I'm not that tall. Uh, I'm not tall at all, so I had to do better, to or I had to to practice better, I had to memorize my lines faster, and I I had to do it better to get his attention because I wasn't tall nga. so I had to do other ways or had to look for other ways to get his attention or to you know to 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 yeah to to be noticed by him so i remember that saying he said that he wanted he liked his actors to to be tall um and then uh the other thing that i noticed was he's very loyal he's very loyal to his friends in the industry and very loyal to his actors um he always collaborated with Joel Lamangan who was a close friend of his uh, and even uh, the casting of Bernardo Bernardo, because he was a good friend of his as well. So you would you would see that he would work with the same people, with the same collaborators, and cast the same actors because he was very loyal to them. Uh, so yeah, Jun Lamangan, he would always like to work with Professor Amiel Leonardia when it comes to the set and to the lighting and to the technical aspects of the play. Um, but he had a very uh, he had a very <laughs> funny side to him also. I remember, and I you know we would always mimic him with how he would um, scold the the crew. He would call them Cucina, hoy Cucina, or uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, everybody had their impression of of Tony Mabesa scolding the the crew or the actors. He would say kuchina chimini a a so i never i've never heard of these terms before him no chimini a a and kuchina i remember for otello um i had some co-actors si haya and si lenner mendoza 
and he never <laughs> failed to call Haya Haya Hararit. Si Haya Hararit, who was an Israeli actress that he knew of from from before, so I guess Haya reminded him of Haya Hararit, so he would call him Haya Hararit. He had this he had this thing where if he had a name for you, even though that wasn't your real name, he would call you that. So yeah. Haya Haya Hararit, remember that so well. Um, and then uh, I remember also for um, Othello, uh, if I remember correctly, Taxro Takio was doing the costumes, and he scolded Tux because all the costumes were all very new and very shiny, and he hated that. He wanted the costumes to have a little bit of wear and tear. To look a little vintagey, and you know, to look like they've actually been worn, and not brand new and sparkling and shiny. He wanted texture in the on the costumes. Um, he had an impeccable sense of style and taste. So, um, I remember him scolding Taksu Takio and calling his his aesthetic tutubanish masyado kang tutubanish meaning you know you you get your clothes from tutuban and they're always the new ones you know always uh, newly laundered and bago pa and shiny so he wanted it to have a wear you know have some wear and tear to have some patina on it or some texture in the costumes but what he didn't like was that if your shoes were not brand new or you know shined he had this thing with shoes kailangan pag if you're on stage he said people will look at your shoes and look at your hair which is makes sense because those are the tips those are the ends of your person no so it's just like a bookcase you see the end so it's important that you had good shoes if not great shoes well uh well shined and new and that your hair was was ayos um and I even remember him uh, advising uh, Mr. Gwyn Guanzon, one of my friends from theater, to wear a goatee because uh, just like myself, uh, Gwyn had a weak chin or a weak jawline. So he said uh, a, a goatee or some facial hair or a beard would help strengthen your, your, your profile. Just like he, just like he did where, you know, he wore a beard. Uh, all throughout his adult life and he never shaved that off so you know little things like that about aesthetics and style and taste and appearance so that you look good on stage he would throw them out every now and then and I you know I'd always wait for him when he said things like that and I remember all those lessons from him up until now 25 years later so yeah tutubanish and then kailangan maganda lagi yung sapatos mo um now with regard to uh with regards to the work so i was talking about um enemy of the people and then othello i do remember watching Philly or Philly 2 with dodo crisol um you know saying his line about um uh, the main, about you know about the main character parang napuno na um, pinasabog niya yung yung you know in the story may pinasabog si uh, si Crisostomo Ibarra puno ng puot at dinamita and the way Dodo Crisol delivered that line was wow earth shattering amazing and of course you know uh, you can only get a performance like that if you have a director like Tony Mabesa um Despite all the the aesthetic and the style uh, and the sense of taste and classicness that he brought to his productions and a sense of um, experimentation that was very subtle was he brought a lot of heart to the the production it it that's something that's hard to to rehearse to engineer it's either you have it or you don't the heart for it and that will come out, come across in your delivery. So I remember Dodo Crisol saying that line, Puno ng puot at dinamita. And I remember also, St. Louis Loves Them Filipinos. I was fortunate enough to see those two productions. Um, and I remember Mario Magalona 
um, playing the role or the lead role for St. Louis Loves Them Filipinos. But I remember this line and this monologue by Alan Palileo um, where he was describing uh, Mario Magalona's character. Um, he was talking about his hair, about how his, his long black hair shone like the skin of a snake. And yung pagbitaw ni Alan Palileo nung line na yon was for for a young actor like myself was something else and that's what that's what I feel Professor Tony Mabesa always brought to his productions ma maaantig ka talaga eh yung maiiyak ka talaga yung tatamaan ka talaga yung with the lines and the delivery the direction shown like the skin of a snake um Alan Palileo delivering that line um and for me, uh, the best play that I have ever seen, uh, ever, and it's not just because it was Tony Mabes's work, but he did this small play, this very intimate play. It, it was even in FC, in, um, you know, Tanghalang Hermogenes Ilagan. Uh, it was a small play in FC starring Ray Ventura, and oh, fr please, uh, Dulang UP, friends and family, please remind me what the title of that uh, play was. But it was starring Ray Ventura as a struggling writer or as a writer. And I remember the ending so well, like it was yesterday or like it was last night. Of course, magat napakahusay na, na artista ni Raven or ni Ray Ventura. Um, so in the end, so he, it was a play about butterflies. You know, I, I think he wanted to write about butterflies. This this act, this writer that Ray Ventura played. And I remember the last scene where the music rose up and the lights uh, got brighter. And then this prop or this set design of butterflies descending down with the light. And with the acting of Raven Tura and then the music, oh my god. Talagang, you know, it will it will lift you up, but it will also bring you to tears. It's hard to explain, but only a real artist or a real, a true, uh, I would say, student of theater or, or of the arts will appreciate um so yeah i that for me that was the best ever uh of the of the few plays that i've seen of sir tony's for me that was the one that i really remember well but the point is in every play there's always a scene that's so heart-rending and so heart-wrenching and and will will really move you and that's what theater is supposed to do right it's supposed to move you to inspire you into action, to feel something. And I feel as a theater director and as a teacher, as a professor, um, Professor Tony Mabesa was really good at. Um, you know, when we were younger, we used to joke around about um, pillars of Philippine theater. Na parang, oh, si ano, Haligi ng, ng teatro ng Pilipinas yan. You know, we would joke about certain actors or directors or writers. But Professor Tony Mabesa was the real deal. He was really the real thing. He was the pillar of Philippine theater. And There will be no one like him. Um, he was something else. Um, not only as an actor or as a director, but as a a teacher, an educator, as a friend to those who knew him, who who, who knew him as their friend, and as a mentor to those who were taught by him. And who were directed by him, and whose lives were um, were touched by him. So, 
remembering Professor Tony Mabesa, he will definitely be missed. Uh, the likes of him we will never see again. Um, Philippine theater exists uh, to this day because of the work that he has done, because of all the other directors and actors that he has trained. And we are, all of us, actors who've worked under him, directors who've worked with him, writers, are all um, well off, better, better people, better human beings, better artists. Because we were so lucky and so fortunate to have worked with him, even at the smallest capacity. Thank you, uh, Professor Mabesa. I, I regret that I was not able to at least, you know, work with you again or to talk to you again at all. Um, I was in the Philippines last July and I was fortunate to bump into Professor Anton Juan in Rockwell and I was able to sit down with him at least for half an hour and talk about the good old days and just to talk to him. I was never never able to do that again with uh, Professor Mabesa. I forgot this one good memory that all of us have with him. You know, if you're in his favor, and it's so it's such a good feeling to be on the on on the good side of of Professor Mabesa. You know, if you're in his good graces, or if you if he likes you, he'll give you an orange. Or an apple. You know, he had this thing with um, pag results, may dala siyang cooler. Eh, yung. May dala siyang igloo na cooler sa rehearsals. And puno ng ano yun? Puno ng soft drinks, ng mineral water, tsaka ng fruit. And if he likes you, whether for that day or for the entire presentation, kung gusto kanya, if you did a good job during the rehearsal, sa abot ang kanya ng orange or ng mansanas. I, I read Pating's post on Facebook about yung binigyan siya ng chocolate bar. Eh. Yeah. So, yeah. We will remember him fondly. Um, Professor Mabesa, thank you for all the lessons and thank you for all the wonderful productions. Rest in peace and we're sending our prayers and condolences to your friends and family and all those you've left behind. Thank you for all the wonderful memories and all for all the wonderful lessons we will always remember you. Rest in peace. Thank you, Professor Tony Mabesa. <laughs>